The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hi, everyone. We're just going to let a few more folks join. I know there's a lot of uh, interested attendees still out there, so we'll start in about one minute. Thanks. Okay, it's 6.01, so let's get started. Um, good evening and welcome to the webinar for Rocky Mountain National Park's Day Use Visitor Access Strategy. Let me go over a few logistics for this evening's meeting. Um, this is, the agenda is on the screen right now. I'm hoping everybody can see it. Um, I'll start with some logistics about the webinar. Um, we'll have some opening uh, remarks and staff introductions. We will have a presentation from park staff, and then we'll have a question and answer session um, at the end after the presentation. Um, uh, the live captioning is available tonight, and so there's a link in the chat box that I just sent out with an ID if you want to take advantage of that service. So you should be seeing a GoToWebinar control panel. Um, that's how you interact with us um, and, and send us questions. Uh, you're in listen-only mode right now during the webinar. And at any time that you have a question about the, the, the presentation, um, please type it in um, during the presentation if you want or after in the questions box in the control panel. And after we get through the formal presentation, there will be questions answered verbally by park staff at the end. So there's a difference between questions and making formal comments. Um, to provide formal comments on the project, we'll accept those through the Planning, Environment, and Public Comment Pepsi site um, at that web address, and I will chat that out in the chat box as well for you. Um, the comment period on this begins May 21st, so that's tomorrow, and runs through July 19th, 2021. Um, so we encourage you to submit questions um, on, on this planning process uh, during the webinar, but if you have a formal comment that you want considered, um, put that into the Pepsi link that we will share with you. And now I'd like to turn it over uh, to Darla Seidels, the superintendent at Rocky Mountain National Park. Very good. Good evening, everyone, and welcome. Uh, we really appreciate everybody being here today. I know everybody's got busy lives these days, and so taking time out of your um, very lovely spring evening is very much appreciated. I'm Darla Seidels, and I am the superintendent at Rocky Mountain National Park. And we are looking forward to this evening as we um, give you some information and provide you all with an opportunity to ask questions and then with information about how to put your comments in the uh, Pepsi system. So before we actually get into the presentation, I just wanted to take a minute to clarify the topic that we're discussing tonight is the long range day use visitor management plan. And so I just want to distinguish between that 
and the various visitor use management pilots that we've done over the last five years. Um, many of you know about those. They include um, everything from us restricting access from 2016 to 2019. We did that in all of our busy areas whenever crowding and congestion uh, warranted and parking lots filled. And then last year, of course, with our timed entry system, and this year, um, lessons learned from that with a second timed entry system. So those are our short-term, what I call kind of interim trials, experiments, short-term stopgap measures that provide us the opportunity to try some different approaches in how we man might manage our ever-increasing visitation and see what might work in the long term. So again, we're focusing today on the long-term plan. So today's meetings are going to be kicking off this initiative, which is going to take us two, possibly even three years in the process. We really want to hear your input, what you value about the park, what you think about the issues that we discuss in this presentation, and if you've got any additional management concepts um, that you're thinking of that we didn't present today, we would really love to hear about that. Again, those formal comments need to go into the Pepsi system. So during tonight's webinar, we are going to discuss the purpose of this long-term planning effort. What are the key issues that are facing the park with regard to our uh, visitor use management? What are the desired um, conditions for the park? And how does it uh, differ between a front country zone where you have visitor centers and parking lots and campgrounds and paved roads to remote wilderness. And then we're going to talk about some potential and very conceptual possibilities for future management strategies. Those may include, you know, any range of the things that we've done over the past five years, and they'll probably include some different strategies. So we want to hear your questions and we want to be able to answer them tonight and let you know what the next steps are after this and again how to submit those formal comments. So go ahead and go to uh, slide two. Okay, let's um, introduce who all we have on tonight that it's part of this presentation or helping behind the scenes. Um, Doug Wetmore, they're uh, under, under other NPS staff on the slide. He was the one that kicked off this um, webinar and he is with the National Park Service Environmental Quality Division out of Denver. Again, I'm Daryl Seidels. Also, um, a large part of the presentation will be done by John Hannon. He is the Parks Visitor Use Management Planner. Kyle Patterson, she is our Public Information Officer. And thank you all for turning on your cameras just to say hi. Sherry Yost, she is the Chief of Park Planning. She'll be helping with questions and answers. And then one other non-NPS staff is Rachel Collins. And she is a project manager with the National Park Service's Denver Service Center that serves the entire National Park Service. And she is uh, also in Denver. So go ahead and go to slide three. Good place to start and kicking off this uh, presentation is just ensuring that everybody understands what the National Park Service mission is. It's, it's different than the Forest Service. It's different than the BLM. It's different than state and county lands but I wanna focus on some of the key words that you see there in that mission. Um, conserving resources, enjoyment, unimpaired for future generations. So it's kind of a, it's a dual system. I kind of describe it as a seesaw. Um, it's very challenging and it's a, it's a very complex thing to try to balance protecting the resources and providing great opportunities for our visitors. And it, it's even more challenging these days um, as our visitation continues to climb. I think we all can acknowledge that the 1990 Colorado is, is unfortunately gone. Um, and so it's incumbent for us to manage the park for the new reality of our current and future generation. And uh, those, excuse me, our current and future visitation and to manage it to ensure that our resources are protected for our kids and our kids' kids. So let's move on to slide four, the next slide. Okay, I'm not going to read this, but um, you can see that we have four tenants as we are addressing the long range visitor plan. And so we are looking at these four items as we go forward over the next couple of years. 
How do we protect the park natural and cultural resources? How do we ensure that the staff and our visitors have a safe experience? How do we ensure an outstanding visitor experience? That, of course, could be different in everyone's mind. And then what is our park operational capacity? In other words, the uh, infrastructure that we have, the um, funding that we have to manage it, and our staffing. So with that, that's uh, going to move us into our topic, our primary topic, and that is Rockies increasing visitation. I think um, everyone would acknowledge that we've had a significant increase in, vi in visitation over the last number of years. Um, and, you know, in, in uh, 2019, before the COVID, we had the third most visited national park in the country with 4.6 million visitors. And you can see that big jump uh, after the floods of 2013. Go ahead and go to the next one. Just wanted to provide some statistics on more recent visitation um, with 2019 when, when it was kind of a non-COVID year. And um, as, I, as I mentioned, we had a, a significant increase, but just look at those numbers of the months. Just between June and September, we had 3.2 million people in the park. Granted, summer's, summer is our bus busiest month for sure, but we stayed pretty full year round, uh, even on the weekends and throughout the winter. Um, interestingly, even with last year's COVID and, uh, you know, the park was closed for two full months, we reopened um, with a timed entry system and we had 65% last year of our maximum capacity. Then we had over 100 days of wildfires. And even with all of those things and timed entry, we were still the fourth most visited national park in the country. So I was I was pretty surprised to see that statistic myself. Um, I figured we'd be further down on the list, but it just goes to show how popular um, Rocky Mountain National Park has become. Um, those of you living in the Front Range, you very well know how popular it's become. Um, our adjacent land management agencies uh, last year saw a 200% increase in visitation, and you know. People are coming out of the woodwork. It's called the COVID crush. They're getting vaccinated. They're coming in other houses. They're wanting to get outside. And while we very much love our visitors, that is a hallmark of the National Park Service. We absolutely do want them to visit, um, but we know that the management doesn't just happen on its own. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to our next speaker to talk about the interagency visitor use management planning framework, and that is Again, Rachel with the Denver Service Center of the National Park Service. Great, thanks, Darla. So wanted to orient folks to the framework that we're using as a part of this planning process. So to guide the planning process and the decision-making for this process, we are using the framework from the Interagency Visitor Use Management Council. And Doug is gonna drop the link to the council's website into the chat. This council was formed in 2011, so 10 years ago this year, uh, and the council provides guidance for long-term visitor use management policies and direction on the most pressing needs and helps build competencies to improve interagency coordination. So there are six federal land management and water management agencies that collaborate on the council to put this guidance together. And the Park Service has fully integrated this guidance into our planning policies and use this as our scaffolding when we're making decisions about visitor use management. The goal of the guidance provided by the IVUMC is to provide that consistent guidance, consistent guidance across the agencies, um, really elevate the professional and scientific approach to managing visitor use, and to really focus on increasing communication and collaboration across the agencies and their communities. So more specifically, the framework that you're seeing on the screen is the kind of major tenets of the guidance that we're using. Uh, and we are using this with the intent that the desired outcome is that we're really planning for high quality visitor experiences while protecting natural resources. So before we move on into the presentation, wanted to give folks a quick orientation to what actually is in this framework. So the framework starts with a yellow box um, there called Build the Foundation. It's the process that we're part of the process we're in now 
about identifying what are the issues, what's really the root cause of them, um, really getting a common understanding of what is the problem that we're trying to solve, and what do we know about that problem statement. Once we do that, we move forward into defining the visitor use management direction, and we do that by asking ourselves, what are we managing for, and how will we know when we've achieved those goals? Some of the major steps we're going to talk about today include desired conditions that answer this, that question for us about what are we managing for, and then we're going to be starting to work through the process of defining indicators and thresholds that will let us know how will we know when we've departed from those conditions or when we're moving towards achieving them. The third element of the framework uh, talks about identifying management strategies. And so it is that step where we start looking at our existing condition and then we look at our current condition and say, where are the gaps in that? And what are some of the how pieces? What are some of the strategies, actions, initiatives that we might take on to help us achieve those desired conditions? Also as a part of that third element is where necessary, uh, identifying and making decisions about visitor capacities and the actions that we would need to manage to those visitor capacities. Once we've kind of put all of that package together about the foundations, the direction that we're heading and the strategies that we'll need to achieve those um, general management direction components, that's when we start to look at what are the potential environmental effects of moving those actions forward, of moving those strategies forward, and that's when we start turning our attention toward the NEPA process about understanding what does it look like to take those and implement them on the ground, and what are the potential implications of doing that. And so that's where we start to move into element four about implementing, monitoring, evaluating, and adjusting things as we go forward. So again, we're going to talk about some of those components as we go uh, throughout the presentation, but if you have any additional curiosities about it, feel free to let us know in the chat box. Uh, or go ahead and click that link into your chat that'll take you to the Interagency Council's website where all of these um, descriptions and resources and tools are available for you to download. So with that, I will turn it over to John to start walking us through the issue statements. Good evening, everybody. I just wanted to put my camera on for a second to say hello. Um, I'm going to turn it off, though, because the uh, the connection is not as strong as it should be, so I don't want to, to lose everybody in the middle of the presentation. Um, so I wanted to start out with some background uh, a little bit before we get into um, the key issues that are facing the park. Um, and, you know, looking at visitor use and impacts from visitation in the park is not a relatively new thing, certainly. The increase in the visitation since 2013 has certainly brought it to the forefront, but Rocky has been looking at uh, visitor use and its impacts um, since uh, the first real good study that started in the late 50s, looking at impacts of recreation on the alpine tundra. Uh, you can see that on, on the chart here. What this is is a chart that outlines all the major um, research work that's been done in the park. Uh, over the past few decades here, or several decades really, um, related to visitor use, um, impacts of visitor use and recreation on the natural environment, and then um, a, a suite of transportation related studies with uh, transit and parking as everything. Um, so let's move into the next slide, Doug. So we're going to discuss several key issues um, that are facing the park um, due to the increased visitation. Now, these key issues are developed over the last um, several years, like I said, primarily being initially informed by all the research work that's been done, but um, also by the staff um, bringing issues forward and things that the park continually is facing. Uh, again, we're here tonight to hear from um, everybody, and so if there are key issues that you think are facing the park um, related to visitation that we didn't capture, that you feel should be added, please um, make comment on that and make us aware of that. That's what this is all about. Um, so let's roll through um, the key issues that um, we see, and probably the first one, um, and one of the 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 ones that folks see the most, or it's very evident to see, is uh, visitor created trails in the park. And, and that includes, we lump into that category, trail widening or braiding of existing trails. 
And certainly these, um, uh, they're also known as social trails as well. And these certainly have an impact on the natural resources and, and the cultural resources within the park as well, but also can play a role in wayfinding. When you have um, trail junctions that have multiple braided trails or visitor created trails, uh, wayfinding can get difficult um, and, uh, and cause issues and um, end up, you know, resulting in search and rescue or um, possibly injury to, to visitors. A uh, couple of examples here, um, the one on the left there is in, in the tundra and uh, the picture on the right there, that's uh, Deer Mountain Trail. Um, that's the beginning of the trail um, at Deer Ridge Junction. Certainly for those folks that have been up there and um, to the Deer Ridge Junction area and the Deer Ridge Trail or the Deer Mountain Trail, uh, you see that that trail has kind of more than one trailhead, uh, several braids um, form into the eventual trail there. A lot of in, uh, resource impact, a lot of soil compaction in that area as well. Let's go to the next slide, Doug. On here, you're seeing a couple of uh, additional pictures of some visitor-created trails. The, the one on the left there is at uh, a place called Marmot Point off of Old Fall River Road. Um, that trail didn't it didn't exist um, when I first started working at Rocky and has um, been created over time uh, through there. You can see in the middle picture there, uh, the width of that trail is ever increasing. Certainly at the beginning, uh, we've actually had vehicles pull up um, in there um, because it, it looks like a dirt road, basically. And then another shot from Deer Ridge Junction. Um, Speaking of uh, social trails and visitor created trails, we've done a lot of mapping of those over the, uh, the past several years, uh, put a pretty big effort into doing that. Uh, for example, in the Lock Vale area, there's actually eight miles of designated official park trail, but we've mapped uh, 25 and a half miles of um, visitor created trails in that area. And so that's three times the amount of designated trails just in that one drainage. Doug, let's go to the next slide. Another key issue that we're seeing um, quite often throughout the park is uh, in, we're increasingly finding human waste um, just off the trail. Uh, last year, we had researchers look in the Lockvale area and the, the photo on the right of the map um, with the poop emojis all over it, um, those are actual mapping of uh, human waste that was found off the trail around the Lockvale area. Um, certainly, you know, it's, a, it's pretty self-evident what the impacts are, not only impacts to soil, uh, the visitor experience, but um, also to water quality. If you think about it, the Lockvale drainage drains into Glacier Creek and that um, feeds into the town of Estes Park's water supply. So um, certainly potential for impacts to areas and infrastructure outside the park as well. Let's move on to the next one. Um, we're getting into the key issues here. These two, the key issues deal with the amount of vehicles and, and visitors that come to the park. Uh, in a typical visitation pattern, what we're seeing is a lot of concentrated use between 10 and three each day in the summertime. That's when most people enter the park and um, all the park and parking lots get very impacted um, by all those vehicles coming at the same time. Um, some of the you know, impacts that we're seeing to that is uh, certainly illegal roadside parking um, as that desire and need and the scarcity of official parking spaces dwindles. Um, folks get creative and, and park cars in places that are not parking spots, and certainly that has a lot of impact to resources um, and, you know, also to the roadway and infrastructure as well. Um, during these periods of high visitation, we're seeing a lot of traffic and parking congestion. You can see in the photo on the right there, that's a view of the Alpine Visitor Center parking lot and the long queue of people wanting to get into that lot off of Trail Ridge Road. Certainly creating delays in parking areas on park roadways, at park entrance stations, 
And then um, also a lot of um, queuing happening at shuttle stops as people exit their vehicles and try to um, use the park shuttle system. One of the big impacts from this for folks is um, on their visitor experience is they're not able to access their primary destination. In 2017, we had a study done of um, where people went when the Bear Lake Road was restricted to private vehicles, when we stopped entry and uh, basically turned people around. We found that um, most people, um, about 50% of the people that were turned around basically just went to the next open spot and waited until they were able to return and get into Bear Lake. Um, let's, next slide, Doug, please. Uh, another key issue facing the park uh, created by the vehicle congestion and the visitor, um, the high visitor numbers is certainly impacts to wildlife. Um, Rocky is known for its wildlife and that's a, a very key activity that folks do in the park is wildlife viewing. But as you can see in the photo in the right, uh, heavy traffic and, you know, um, causes uh, um, impacts to wildlife. They're free. Um, they're no longer free to move about their environment. Uh, certainly can impact their migration and their breeding. Um, let's go to the next slide to look at a couple more pictures of wildlife. Um, certainly impacts from um, visitation. Uh, folks getting uh, pretty close to wildlife, um, taking their selfies with that. I like the photo on the right. She's taking her nice selfie. You can also see what it does to traffic um, as it causes quite a backup as well. The next slide. Um, again, more dealing with uh, the high visitation and in, in, in the park. And in a lot of areas of the park, we get a, a lot of high con concentrations of visitors. And we have overlapping conflicting uses um, in adjacent areas. Um, again, like I mentioned previously, it's difficult for people to um, access the preferred destination. Certainly all this high visitation um, can impact the folks when they're trying to have their wilderness experience and, and experience those wilderness characteristics that uh, Rocky is known for. Um, also during these high visitor use periods, uh, it creates a lot of uh, frustration and tension for visitors. And we see that play out in a portion of our visitors um, getting quite hostile and having hostile interactions between other visitors and then um, visitors having hostile interactions with park staff. Um, we, we see that in increasing numbers and it, it's certainly a concern. Next slide, Doug. Um, you know, um, this next uh, key issue centers around our facilities. And if you think about it, Rocky, if you're a building in Rocky, you're already facing some pretty harsh environmental um, challenges to your existence. And then overlay that increased visitation. And um, we're finding that the life cycle or the maintenance cycles of some of our buildings is, is much more rapid than it should be. Um, we're finding that um, there's excessive wear and tear from the heavy use that we're seeing. Uh, these are all photos of restrooms. And I, if anybody, you know, I'm sure you can relate to this if you've been in the park in any of these um, peak visitation times. Uh, restrooms are uh, certainly one of the most popular features of the park. Um, and what you don't see is the impacts on our, our water systems and our wastewater systems as well. Um, that, uh, you know, these impacts bring. Um, let's go to the next slide, Doug. So another key issue, uh, again, with the high visitation, the high traffic volumes, this really impedes our ability to provide and do the basic functions of operating the park. And that's the whole array, um, not only the maintenance that I was talking about on the previous slide, uh, being able to clean restrooms, being able to um, perform regular maintenance that we need to do on our facilities. Um, our functions um, to provide ranger-led programs have been impacted. And over the years, 
Um, we've had to stop offering um, interpretive programs in the Bear Lake Road corridor because it's too difficult for our um, rangers to get to these programs and also too difficult for folks that want to um, enjoy and, and participate in the program. And then um, you see that last uh, sentence there, or the last couple of words in um, the bullet, that's the, of most concern is our ability to respond to an emergency. When you have traffic volumes like this and you're trying to get an ambulance or first responders to a situation, um, that's very difficult. One of the things that uh, has been, that we're doing this year is we're actually studying um, what it would take and how long it would take to do an evacuation of Bear Lake Road, also the Wild Basin Road. Um, that's a study that some researchers are working on this summer. Uh, that's key information for us moving forward. They're going to give us some scenarios of how long it would take uh, if there was a, you know, a major incident, uh, such as a wildfire or something, how long it would take for us to get folks out of the Bear Lake Road corridor. Um, let's go to the next slide. Uh, again, um, you know, I mentioned wildfire on the previous slide. It's a good segue to this. Um, we've seen an increase in illegal campfires in the park um, commensurate with the, the visitation increase. Um, if you can think back, if you're familiar with the area in the park in 2013, the Fern Lake fire, uh, that was an illegal campfire that uh, got out of control and started um, burning. Um, it uh, headed to uh, Estes Park before it was stopped. It was fortunately stopped in within the park, but uh, did have uh, evacuation consequences for part of Estes Park. Um, we've seen quite a number of uh, illegal campfires. Um, these photos show, uh, you know, sometimes we can get to them when they're small in stature. Sometimes we get to them when they're a little larger. Um, we see that trend um, and it's, uh, it's of concern. We'll go to the next slide. So um, we're going to move into the next section here. We're going to talk about desired conditions. Rachel mentioned earlier the interagency visitor use management framework, and this definition of desired conditions is uh, straight from that framework. And really, when you're thinking about desired conditions, these are statements of aspiration and describe the resource conditions, the visitor experience and opportunities, and also the facilities and services that you'll find in a particular area of the park. Um, it's really important to make the distinction that desired conditions are the conditions that we want the park to be at, not necessarily the current conditions. Um, Rocky's kind of a, a unique park in a special place because 95% uh, of the park is designated wilderness. Um, and with that, that kind of gives us our first set of desired conditions. The Wilderness Act um, paints a picture of several characteristics of wilderness, and, and we've listed some of them here. You know, pristine, natural conditions, the opportunity for um, solitude, the opportunity for self-reliance unconfined recreation and an untrammeled natural environment. Um, so the Wilderness Act and with Rocky being 95% wilderness, that kind of sets the tone for us of, you know, what our initial desired condition should be. So let's go to the next slide. So um, I apologize here. I know these virtual meetings, that's one of the downsides uh, is we have this nice map, but it's on your on your computer. Uh, so the fidelity of it is, is a little small, but hopefully you can see that. That's the park. Um, we have split the park up into three visitor use management zones, and those tie directly back to the desired conditions. You'll find desired conditions differ a little bit for each zone. We're going to run through um, some of the highlights of the desired conditions here. So let's go to the next slide. And again, at this point, I want to give another plug for this is the opportunity that we want to hear from the public. What desired conditions do you want to see in these areas of the park? Um, are, is there something we're missing here? So again, um, make sure that if you uh, have some opinions or an idea, please share it with us. So zone one, zone one is the largest zone. It's all the green that you see on the map there. 
and zone one is all in designated wilderness. And this is the, the zone that's um, where you're gonna have the least amount of trail traffic and the least amount of encounters. Now an encounter on there, what that really means is the number of people that you're gonna see as you're hiking on the trail or you're gonna see in that area. So in this zone, in the green zone there, you're gonna see very low numbers of people. This is going to give you the best chance, best opportunity for that pristine wilderness experience um, and, you know, to meet those wilderness characteristics. Let's go to the next slide to finish up on zone one. Um, again, zone one, you know, provides those outstanding to moderate opportunities for solitude and self-reliance as designated under the Wilderness Act. Um, this is where the ecological systems are, you know, they're free from the influence of modern interventions, uh, free from a lot of management input from the, the park. Uh, this is where nature basically does its thing the best. Um, and then zone one consists of minimally, main, minimally maintained designated trails and cross country routes. Let's go to zone two. Now, zone two is the yellow that you see on the map there. Um, zone two, if you're familiar with the park, you're going to recognize that zone two kind of encompasses most of the designated trails within the park. Um, zone two is in all wilderness again. So zone one and zone two make up that 95% of wilderness that the park is. Um, in zone two, this is where you're going to see a little more moderate trail traffic and, and encounters. You're going to see a few more people than you do in zone one. Um, and like I mentioned earlier, you know, this is where the most of the designated and developed trails are um, in the park. This gives you a wide variety of recreational opportunities, uh, you know, for folks of what they're looking to but still able to experience some of those wilderness qualities as well. Let's go to the next slide. Again, natural landscapes and resources are generally, um, you know, left to do what they do best, but they are minimally or moderately managed um, to ensure visitor safety and, and optimize resource protection where we can. Um, visitors are more likely to encounter park staff on these trails and more likely to expect um, a little quicker response time um, to emergencies in these areas. And again, like I said, um, this is where you find the vast majority of the official trail corridor. Uh, let's go to the, the last zone, Doug. So zone three, zone three is the orange on the map there and zone three is that five percent of the park it's non-designated wilderness uh, the best way to think about it it's pretty much most of the built environment of the park uh, the exception being kind of the blob of orange there just outside of estes park that's the deer mountain area that um, part of the park is not designated wilderness uh, the rest of the orange is pretty much encompassed by um, you know, the roadways, the parking lots, the visitor center, the front country campgrounds, um, our accessible trail systems are in there. Uh, these are where you're going to find, you know, really the, the hardened environment and, uh, you know, the most main, meticulously maintained trails. Let's go to the next slide. Yeah, uh, this is also where you're going to find Trail Ridge Road. Um, Trail Ridge Road is, is a unique feature of the park. Um, you know, it's uh, a hardened roadway, but it does give a vast majority of people uh, the ability to connect and, and see one of the premier resource um, parts of the park, and that's the Alpine Tundra. Um, so it gives you the opportunity to engage or experience the tundra um, from established infrastructure and overlooks. Um, again, you know, these are, this is the, the, the hardened areas of the park, uh, the roadways. It gives you uh, easy, accessible visitor experiences, such as scenic drives, opportunities for wildlife viewing. Uh, this is where you're going to find interpretive ranger programs, uh, you know, a lot of our scenic vistas and then the visitor centers. 
Um, this is where you can learn about the park. This is where we hope to create, you know, stewardship for the park with our visitors. Let's go to the next slide, Doug. Um, so at this point, we're going to shift the topic and we're going to get into, you know, the conceptual long range strategies. Uh, we're going to start with a little bit of background on um, the current strategies. Darla mentioned some of this at the beginning. As we go through these, the thing I want to emphasize to everybody is we're not thinking that there's one bullet in here that's going to solve all the problems. Uh, I think it's we're looking at probably a suite of strategies that will either be, um, you know, in a specific area of the park and encompass all of the park. There's going to be a variety of solutions um, for our visitation issues. So I think um, that's what I want you to keep in mind is it's there's not a silver bullet on here. There's not one thing that's going to to, you know, change the course of the the visitation that we're seeing and um so let's get into what we have been doing again darla mentioned this at the beginning but um you know we've been doing um temporary vehicle restrictions in the bear lake road corridor also in wild basin when it warrants uh, we've been actively managing the alpine visitor center um that parking lot when it gets uh, extremely busy um We've been doing a, a lot of work with our parking infrastructure in the park. Some of it you may not notice, some of it may have been subtle, but some of the things that we've done over the, the recent years is, um, you know, for example, we've changed the um, uh, configuration of the Glacier Gorge parking lot to um, increase the flow a little better, certainly to facilitate shuttle buses. Um, Working through that, we've done a variety of kind of restriping and adjustments to some parking lots in the park. We've done um, parking delineators on to mitigate uh, illegal roadside parking. They've been pretty successful in some areas where vegetation has come back. Um, the shuttle system in the park, uh, there's been a version of the shuttle system ever since the late 70s. Uh, the modern system, which I like to call it, uh, basically started in 2000. We've done a lot of uh, tweaks to that. Certainly in recent years, we've adjusted, made schedule adjustments and some stop adjustments to try to improve that system. And then again, um, Darla also mentioned it, we've done the uh, piloted a couple of timed entry systems, one last year and then one kicking off here um, on the 28th for the 2021 season. Let's go to the next slide. So this is where we're going to start talking about, you know, the long range strategies and really we're looking for feedback on, you know, your thoughts on, um, you know, how these are going to be addressing the issues. Um, you know, we're looking at advanced reservation systems and timed entry. Um, you know, we've done the, the one pilot, going to start the another pilot here um, shortly. And, and this can be applied to, you know, reservations for vehicles, parking spaces, or shuttle access. Uh, the key benefit to these types of systems is it really spreads that use throughout the day. Like I mentioned, we have that big crunch, 10 to 3 usually. And um, early morning and late afternoon, we have parking lots that are not full and, and, and trailheads that, you know, don't see a lot of traffic. Under these types of systems, you're able to spread that use more evenly throughout the day. So you don't get a big crunch, and yet you're able to use your existing infrastructure more effectively. Um, the other bullet on here is, you know, these could be applied to the entire park or just key locations as well. Let's move on to the next one. Um, you know, there's a whole host of parking related strategies that could be implemented for any of our parking lots or a, a host of our parking lots. There's a lot of um, managed entry type systems, either through automated gate arms or even staffing. Um, you could meter parking lots, you could do one in, one out, um, things like that. There's a lot of uh, tech the logical things that could be employed. I'm sure a lot of you are, are familiar, um, you know, a lot of the parking structures that you go to along the front range here have um, spot monitoring. That's where they have a sensor in each parking spot and they tell you how many 
spaces are available uh, on each floor. In our case, we could, you know, implement these systems and it could tell you how many spaces are available in all the different lots. Um, and again, this would all be coupled with, you know, some advanced or real time messaging on parking status throughout the park. Let's go to the next one. Um, getting into some transportation related um, strategies, uh, we could enhance our use of intelligent transportation systems. Um, ITS, those are systems that, you know, use technology to help you kind of get the most out of your infrastructure, direct people to where there's parking available or where there's not congestion or advise people where there's congestion. Uh, again, if you've been in the park in the last several years, you've seen us using variable message signs um, to inform either on parking, on shuttles, or on um, vehicle restrictions going into place in Bear Lake. Uh, again, you could do a lot with um, automated gates to regulate flow, not only in parking areas, but on roadways. If you think about it, you could do metering on Old Fall River Road and, and pace the traffic up there rather than having, you know, bunches of traffic going up, um, followed by times of, of no traffic. And certainly, again, lots of, uh, you know, monitoring type systems um, that could all feed up into an app or some kind of uh, notification on your phone to tell you where parking or uh, where heavy traffic congestion is. Let's go to the next slide. Again, uh, you know, these could be park-wide solutions or targeted area-specific strategies. Um, you could employ other things for popular hikes, permitting that um, and trying to sp spread that use out or cap the number of people that, you know, go to a particular area in a day. Uh, you know, prime example of that would be permits to, uh, um, hike the Long's Peak, um, you know, area specific or, or seasonal closures could be implemented to help protect resources. We do this already on some basis where we have the meadow closures um, for the elk in the fall, in the evening, also rapture closures, or rapture closures for um, nesting in the springtime. Uh, you, could, you could deploy things like this to help manage and protect park resources. So uh, next slide. And I'll turn it over to Doug. Great, thanks, John. So in a few slides, I'm just gonna let folks know what is next in the planning process. Um, we are essentially in a, a pre-planning or pre-NEPA stage right now. Um, as you can see, we have civic engagement scheduled for now, May, 2021. Um, we'll start the public comment period tomorrow and through July 19th, and then um, we'll uh, produce a civic engagement summary in this fall and have that available for the public to review. Um, it's likely that the park will want to go into do some additional research and data collection to support this planning effort, uh, most likely next spring or summer, and then the park would use those public comments and refine these strategies and, and develop some preliminary proposed action and alternatives, probably around late 2022. Um, and then hopefully launch a NEPA public scoping process in 2023. And these are just some, some target timeframes. Nothing is, is set in stone here. So this is what the park is kind of hopes to achieve um, in the near future. Um, just a little bit about NEPA. I'm sure a lot of folks know what it is. I think we're, we're not there yet. Um, and I'm not going to read the whole slide to you. It'll be available with the whole slide deck. But it's really just to let folks know that it's it's the process for when the government makes decisions and, and to make sure that we have a public process that has um, you know several opportunities for public involvement throughout the way. Um, and then make sure that before any decisions of a permanent nature are made um, that we interact with the public and and do it in an open way um, and that we consider all different disciplines and, and not just um, you know just environmental it's also about some social and 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 visitor experience type considerations as well so let's talk about you know questions and comments um, for tonight 
the question and answer period. I see that many of you have already been typing things into the questions box, which is great. Um, we're looking to answer your questions on the park's long-term um, planning solutions um, tonight. Uh, starting tomorrow, the formal comment period begins. Um, that's your initial opportunity to comment on this planning process. And of course, as I said, there will be more opportunities um, when the park approaches a, a formal NEPA process. And so that's the website. Um, it's the parkplanning.mps.gov um, um, website. I will chat out that link um, again in the chat box just so you have uh, ready access to it. Um, and now we're going to start the question and answer um, part of the webinar. We've already got a lot of questions, I think, queued up. And so um, if you want to continue to type your questions in the questions box, that's great. Um, we are slated till um, 7.30 tonight. And so we'll stay on as, as long as we can to answer your questions if they're still coming in. So um, anyway, I'm going to turn it over to Kyle at the park um, to facilitate this next session. Thank you. Great, thanks so much, Doug, and for all the uh, rest of our NPS colleagues and staff who um, presented tonight. So as Doug mentioned, most of our, um, and I'm gonna turn off my camera here for a second again, I'm, I'm concerned that uh, my bandwidth won't accept that. So I'm gonna move over to the questions and keep speaking here. As Doug mentioned, you know, some of the questions that we got right at the beginning of the presentation before we uh, started through some of the explanation in the presentation, we may have already answered those questions, but we're just gonna um, address these really quickly. Um, these are mainly tied to this year's time and entry permit system. And so let's, let's just talk about that really quickly and then move on to why we're here this evening to really focus on our long range planning efforts. So one of the questions is basically, why have you begun a process to permanently restrict access and are only asking for input now? So I, I think one of the things that we really, again, want to emphasize from what Darla and, and John mentioned is we have seen this uptick in visitation um, as we have demonstrated. I don't think anyone's surprised that's on this call of a 44% increase since 2012. In 2015, we saw a 20% increase in that year alone. And so that's when we started really addressing the four tenants that we talked about, visitor and staff safety, resource protection, operational capacity, and visitor experience, uh, the four areas and tenants that we've spoken with or spoken about multiple times during the presentation. 20% was in 2015, and so in 2016, we started managing access uh, in response to some of those things that we saw in 2015 and prior to that, quite frankly, as, as John mentioned in some of our key issues. And so we've been managing access since 2016, but as Darla mentioned, those have been all very, you know, reactive, short-term, stopgap measures. In 2016, we also shared in our news releases that these were all short-term efforts and that we knew if we just focused on certain areas that it would push the use in other areas. So like, you know, the balloon theory, you squeeze one side of the balloon, it goes elsewhere. So from the beginning, we've known that this needs to be some kind of a holistic plan or else you just push the issues into other areas of the park and or into other public lands surrounding Rocky Mountain National Park. So we've been, you know, acknowledging and trying to address that complex issue. Then last year, 2020 happened, um, something that none of us were expecting, uh, added additional challenges, as, as we've talked about before, with um, public health concerns, closure of the park for two months, reopening um, with, the, with the excitement of being able to reopen the park, to be able to welcome all of us back into the park. And that's when we started that very quickly developed time and entry permit system. Um, COVID did not go away this year, and so we know that we're having challenges with COVID. Um, we've talked about how our visitation has continued to increase since November of last year in our surrounding areas, as Darla mentioned, seeing 200% increase. Shuttle bus capacity questions for this year, 
as well as fire impacts in many of our um, busy areas. So all of that, again, made us move toward a very temporary solution again for this summer. So um, it, you know, it's, it's concerning that, um, that maybe it's looked at as a way to shove things through and it's, it's not. It's a purely reactionary mode. And then we look at long range planning, which we've been talking about since 2016. Our hope was to start that long range planning last year but again, 2020 occurred. And so we are so excited to be at this point now where we're engaging uh, the public and getting input and thoughts on all of the different issues that we addressed. Darla, before I move on to some of the other questions, do you have anything else to add on that? No, that's a great answer, Kyle. And I would just reinforce what you've said that you know, right now we are not implementing uh, management strategies for for a permanent you know future that's why we're doing this webinar now is to start thinking about um, a permanent or a long-term solution and everything we've done up to this point informs that long-term plan but we have not made any um, permanent solutions or permanent determinations as of yet that's why we need y'all's input exactly and why we're trying to make the most of last year and this year with all of the different challenges that the park is facing, learning those lessons and, and um, looking to see what works and what, you know, what doesn't work and, and where there are some challenges. So some other questions, um, you know, that, that tie into some of those challenges that um, we've been asked. So um, how, what, it, what is our plan? Um, to address when people do make reservations for a timed entry permit system. So this year in particular, the question is tied to again, our management efforts this year. Um, if somebody doesn't have a smartphone um, or they um, you know, are, are possibly um, challenged for another reason, uh, whether it's uh, the, the person here says if there if there's uh, an age issue where they're not able to address it and navigate the system. So, and then also the current reservation system is an example of how income inequality is now preventing people from experiencing their national park. So we'd like to address that maybe with a couple of different thoughts, you know, as we do look at different concepts and as we talked about the, the Pepsi, um, uh, way to comment, we'd, we'd love to get your thoughts and input as to how we might be able to better communicate or address those issues. If you have some suggestions or solutions for that, that would be great. We do know that um, we've been working a lot with partners, um, libraries that are walking people through um, that might have a problem accessing that. We have a park information office that staffs seven days a week with uh, seven days a week with staff and volunteers. Um, we had 1,300 calls the, the first week, and many of our um, responses were helping people through the reservation system and just talking about the reservation system as a whole. Um, Recreation.gov also has a call center where they assist people through that process too. And there is a phone number uh, that people can call as well to, to talk through the reservation if they don't have a smartphone. And so, John, maybe could you address that as far as recreation.gov? And then again, we'll wrap up some of these comments for this year and move on to some of the questions that we're getting about kind of the, the bigger picture. John, could you address that? Yeah, sure, Kyle. Um, yeah, like you did mention, um, recreation.gov does have an 800 number where you can call uh, their call center and they're there to either help you through the process or you can um, book a reservation with them over the phone uh, because there is a call center and it's a little more labor intensive. It's actually a $3 reservation fee instead of a $2 reservation fee. Uh, the downside with that though is the, um, you still do need an email and you still need email because that's how they send you your, your confirmation so it's not a hundred percent solution for that but it certainly um gets you a little further along um yeah so i think that that's good on that kyle 
Okay, great. That's helpful, John. And and again, through some of our information office questions, we've had um, you know, people that have had family members or grandkids that have been with them and and having us send it to their email addresses and um because many of the folks really want to figure it out and really want to be um part of that part of that solution and and uh being included that way as well. So we have had a few of those and we've been continuing to work with them. But again, if you have suggestions uh, on continuing to make that accessible, we'd love to hear from you when you're commenting in the in the Pepsi aspect. Along those same lines, um, the question was, how is a reservation system addressing, you know, again, this year, or if we were to use it in the future, how would it address socioeconomic um, concerns? And so um, I will just say a few comments and then have John uh, address that as well. But you know, some of the other things that we certainly have at Rocky Mountain National Park that um, are things that we already are looking at or addressing is that we have an, um, a day pass that's $25 and a weekly pass that's $35. And so when people are already coming to Rocky Mountain National Park, they're purchasing an entrance pass in order to come into the park. So people that are visiting the park are already um, spending um, uh, their money for these passes. So John, can you talk through, you know, again, when we're talking about socioeconomic, a reservation um, for $2 is, is, um, is part of the whole picture. Yeah, ex exactly, Kyle. Um, you know, when, um, and actually the park in the, in the late 90s did have a, um, some research work done on what the the roadblocks were for getting folks who are you know socioeconomically challenged into the park um and you know they identified several several kind of um things hurdles basically from getting them to to come visit and and one of them was fees like Kyle addressed um so the two dollar reservation fee granted is is an initial fee um, one of the things that the Park Service does is do free days in the park. There's several of those during the, the year, so you don't have to pay the entrance fee. Um, the, uh, the other big challenge there is, is transportation. And that's something that, you know, we as the park alone cannot solve. Um, certainly we can work with partners to do that. One effort that is currently underway is um, the, uh, the use of busting. That's um, CDOT's um, commuter service. Uh, they ran a pilot um, in 2019 that was highly successful. They're going to run it again on weekends this summer. Um, and that uh, it brings folks um, for uh, you know, a pretty good subsidized fare from Denver. They're going to have a stop in Boulder and Lyons and then come up. And um, we're going to meet them with a, a a special bus to get them access to the park. So that's one way. Again, you know, that's one of the the hurdles that you know we face. But um, you know, that's a solution. I think that you know we need partners beyond the park to address as well. And then the other thing that you know has been cited not only in, in our study in in the late '90s, but also in other studies that you know we've referenced is um, just kind of the perceived barrier um, that there is to the park of coming to a national park. And, um, you know, I think, again, that's where partners come in, where, um, you know, us working with groups that um, have connections in these communities that um, set up experiences and educate folks that it's it's maybe it's not as daunting as they might feel or maybe it's not as um you know not worth it as they feel or whatever their perception of it may be um so yeah it's definitely on our radar as something to be addressed but you know it's again it's like most things there's not a simple straightforward answer and i think some of those answers um are going to be um, solved not just through the park, but through the park working with other entities to address. Great. Thank you, John. You know, another big success we've had too is through our amazing environmental education program where we connect with um, kids from urban school settings that have never been in a national park before 
and and they come up and have a great learning experience and then um, encourage their families to come back. And so there's a lot of different great ways to to connect with um, to connect with folks and have them attached to Rocky Mountain National Park. A couple of other quick things that are just kind of um, some questions we've received about just um, you know another uh, issue. Um, somebody mentioned or asked about the uh, fast pass lane and and what's what the problem is with the fast pass lane. So just let me take a moment to to answer that really quickly again, and then we'll move back to the subject at hand here. But um, we we have had um, some new passes that um, are more looking at um, the a barcode versus a magnetic strip. So the old passes that went through our fast pass lane had a magnetic strip. The new passes have a barcode. And so um, there's some technical difficulties as the new passes speak with the, um, the technology. So basically this was uh, an issue that the component to operate the gate won't marry with the new passes. So that's been a, a challenge that our staff has been uh, trying to address. And we, we hope that with working with a variety of different vendors, um, they're gonna be able to help out that system. So appreciate your um, patience, apologize for that. And um, you know, just, just a reminder that when the reservation system kicks in, the fast pass lane won't be working between that nine to three hour period, um, because obviously we'll need people to come through to show us their reservation. But again, before nine and after three and up until May 28th, please know that we're trying to resolve that situation. Okay, so one other, um, I think that's it for kind of what is, is happening now with the reservation period. And, and again, when we talk about those, you know, if, if there's some barriers, if, if you have some suggestions on how to address those or better ways to communicate that or more tools, you know, please, we'd, we'd love to hear from you through the Pepsi, Pepsi uh, program. Um, so uh, another question is is related to the current reservation system, um, and and you know again for future reservation systems if that's uh, a tool that we use. It, the question is the current reservation system poses a large issue for locals. This park, will you update your system to allow for locals to enter the park without making reservations? So. You know, certainly um, it's important to note that Rocky Mountain National Park is a national park. And so, um, you know, to define a local, um, we know that in 2010, the last time we did a survey, about 30 to 40 percent of our visitors were coming from Colorado. So to define a local, uh, first of all, we national parks don't allow locals to have special access over other visitors. And then what defines a local? Would that be an Estes Park resident, a Grand Lake resident, a Grand County County? You can see where it could then become very um, difficult on who defines a, a local. So Darla, do you have anything else to, to add to that point? Yeah, just um, that was one of the things that we did this year to modify what we did last year. And that is the what we're calling the rest of the park reservation for this year is in a shortened time frame. So last year, you know, we had one reservation system for the entire park and it covered the entire day. This year for the rest of the park, it's only between 9 a.m. and 3 p.m. And so um, it allows access if people don't have a reservation. Obviously, we prefer people to get a reservation if they're coming in the highest um, peak period between 9 and 3 that's required, but if you come before nine or after three, um, you wouldn't have to have a reservation. And so um, that plus, you know, just the proximity of locals to the park, you've, you've got access earlier than maybe somebody who's coming up an hour and a half from Denver and later. Um, so, you know, we really did try to think of ways to, to kind of help out the locals or to, to provide, you know, additional incentives for the locals. but. Kyle's right, um, as a national park, we're not allowed um, to, to set a preference for the locals over you know, the national public that the park serves, so. Thank you, Darla. And there, there were a couple of other questions on that. Is there consideration to only restrict access to out-of-state visitors? And so um, I think we, we addressed that. Um, 
can you we've, we've had a question as to do we know and john was highlighting um some of the impacts we've seen when it comes to human waste and the lock bell drainage you know social trails some of the key issues that we addressed is there any way that you can basically determine um who's causing that damage so basically um it is there one group that's causing that? Is that locals, out of state people? Is it categorized to a certain age or a certain type of visitor? And um, you know, I think that the the short answer to that is is no. It'd be very difficult to determine who is um, who is uh, stepping off the trail and going to the bathroom. Is it locals? Is it uh, people that are coming from other states? And so we we don't have the data that is that is demonstrating you know who is doing that or who is causing uh, some of the social trailing you know again when you're looking at the overall numbers of park visitors it's uh it's it's likely going to be a combination but no we we don't know nor nor we re do we really have a way of of breaking um breaking that down as far as who is doing that those impacts and john speaking of that you know we did a survey in 20 and saw what our visitors were. We know we have a lot of visitors that come from Colorado um, and come from the Front Range to visit Rocky Mountain National Park. So I'll pause for a moment. Maybe you can talk a little bit about you know future uh, survey efforts that we have. Yeah, um, yeah. The last um, visitor survey we had was 2010. So yeah, that data is a little old. Fortunately, we are on the um, next in line for a, vi a com comprehensive visitor survey in 22. Um, they'll do it like they did last time, um, survey winter and summer visitors. And that will give us a, you know, a great um, idea of the, not only the demographics of our visitors, uh, certainly where they're, they're coming from, but there'll also be some, you know, with those surveys, they're pretty comprehensive. There'll be some questions in there about, um, you know, their preferences of what they want to visit in the park, and also some uh, economic data um, will be coming out of that as well on, you know, how much they spend in the area and um, with their trip. Uh, you know, it's important to know, I'm, I'll take the opportunity to mention it, uh, you know, in case folks don't know. You know, Rocky is a national park, but we have very regional visitation. Um, you know, speaking of that 2010 survey that put our international visitors at 4%, uh, you know, you contrast that with uh, Grand Canyon or Zion National Park, uh, that's vastly different in those parks. Um, you know, most folks, like Kyle mentioned, 35 to probably around 40% are from Colorado. Then after that, um, you know, we get to Nebraska, Kansas, and Texas. Um, so it's very regional, our visitation. Um, and it's it's a little different. It's You got to keep that into consideration when you're thinking about long range planning because you're not, um, and the other thing too is we, we've, um, from the data we have, we have people that are very repeat visitors that come every year or come multiple times a year. Um, so that's a little different too, you know, folks going to Yellowstone, maybe that's once every 10 years, um, but Rocky, it's it's a frequently visited park and, and visited often by those who do come. Great, thanks, John. Um, in, in the interest of time, we do have a number of questions really kind of narrowing down on specific questions for this year's time entry permit system. So I, if we have time again to circle back and talk about that at the end, um, we're happy to, to do that as well um, and also share some additional resources of where you can find out some of the questions to your answers about this year's timed entry system. But we would like to jump back and and uh, honor those questions that are about the overall long range planning efforts that we're talking about tonight. So um, one of the questions, and John, I'm gonna uh, toss this to you. Wouldn't it make sense to close at least the Bear Lake corridor in high season? This would enhance the experience and enable shuttle buses, including hiker shuttle to not be bogged down. Further, the amount of visitation could be managed via the shuttle system. Parks policy is having a, a big impact on carbon emissions. 
So John, could you talk a little bit about the shuttle system and you know the infrastructure we've put in place for parking along the Bear Lake Road and how we weave the shuttle into that? Yeah, exactly. Um, so, you know, that idea on on the surface has some merit, but it also has some challenges as well. Um, you know, you can contrast that with a park like Zion that does do that. Um, and the difference there between Zion and Rocky is um, in the Bear Lake Road corridor, uh, there's more parking in the Bear Lake Road corridor there than there is in the rest of the park. Um, so uh, there's an awful lot of parking infrastructure that is in the Bear Lake Road corridor. Um, so to kind of close that down and not utilize that, that parking would need to be recreated somewhere else to feed all those shuttle riders. Um, you know, most likely, uh, you know, that does speak to, you know, possibility of, you know, you could build additional infrastructure outside the park exterior and use the shuttle system to bring people in. Uh, certainly a shuttle system is a great way to manage the use and the flow of visitors into the into the park or into a specific, a specific area. Um, you know, you're able to utilize the schedule of the shuttle and the frequency to manage the numbers of people that you do bring in. Um, and that's one of the reasons, uh, you know, if you've been visiting the park for the last probably six or seven years, um, the shuttle system really hasn't changed overall, and we've certainly not changed the, the time. We've uh, added a little capacity earlier in the morning and later in the evening. Um, but, you know, that's one way to manage uh, the flow of visitors. Um, so unfortunately, you know, some of the design work that was done in Bear Lake Road early on um, has set it up to where um, the feature of the corridor is having the parking within the corridor and also having the shuttle within the corridor there. Um, so it would be it would be challenging. It would be radically different, but it's certainly not an idea that is not worth exploring to some extent. But yeah, mainly, um, you know, the not the you know more parking is like I said, more parking is in the Bear Lake Road corridor than in the rest of the park. So. Um, and then you, you know, couple that with all the trail options and all the loop trail options that are created by the hike or by the shuttle service. Um, it, it, that's what one of the features that makes it such a compelling area to visit. Thanks, John. And in 2019, I believe we moved about 700,000 um, people or riders on the shuttle bus. Um, and we also have the sh hiker shuttle that's in place from the Estes Park Visitor Center um, that that began as well to try to keep people from, um, you know, having to take their cars into the park and riding that shuttle um, as well. So continuing to explore that, but then also realizing that you have surges uh, at trailheads when you have buses um, as well. So there's there's always some complex, re you know, reactions to some of those tools as well. Um, are there a lot of trails in the green zone or is it inaccessible due to elevation? So John, I'm going to lob that again your way as far as just, you know, what trails are really in the green zone. And then um, just to remind people that you can go to the Pepsi site uh, when it's posted tomorrow and you'll be able to really look closely at those maps. Yeah, there certainly are uh, quite a number of trails in the, in the green zone. Um, and there's uh, some cross country routes as well in the green zone. Um, and if, a way to think about it too is, uh, you know, a lot of those trail systems that are in zone two, the yellow zone that we saw, um, they continue on into the green zone. Um, you know, there are less than, than in the yellow. In the yellow is where you find kind of all those circuits where you can loop around, like I mentioned, within the Bear Lake corridor where you can start at Bear Lake, you can hike all the way down and come out at Sprague Lake and catch the shuttle back. Um, you know, that's all that trail system is in, in the yellow zone, but there are still trails in the green zone. Um, but the green zone is, you know, it's the vast majority of the park. It's probably the, you know, to characterize it, it's the most pristine um, 
you know, encompasses some of the more rugged areas of the park as well. Um, you know, there are areas that are, you know, difficult to access in that area, in the green zone. Um, and that's, that's the differentiation between the two. It's not that there's not trails. It's not that you can't go in there. It's just, it's a different experience than you find in the yellow zone. It's uh, more remote um, and certainly more self-reliance is required. Great, thanks, John. In addition to this, I think you addressed it a little bit, but if you have anything um, else to add, it says, it seems that the bulk of the issues you've identified are zone three issues. How can you keep open access to zones two and three? Well, yeah, that's certainly, you know, when you paint the picture of it um, by the zone, zone three is where all the vehicles are. There's no vehicle activity in zone one or two. Um, there's certainly, you know, the result of vehicle activity when people get out of their cars and start exploring the park. Um, it, it's interesting, you know, it's, it's, I'll say from zone three and then to zone two and one, and that's where the suite of strategies come in. Um, zone three, you probably are looking at vehicle management strategies and how that plays out into zone two and one. Um, you know, some of that's going to depend on the amount of vehicle access you provide or access through shuttle bus or, or other means. Um, but, you know, you also need to manage for the resource. And that's what we're trying to do more in zone um, one and two is manage for the resource and manage for the impact on those park resources. Um, so, you know, it, it's, they're kind of separate, but they're related as well. So it's, and it, I think that question exemplifies how challenging this all can be as well. Um, you know, if it was just a matter of managing for a certain number of vehicles, um, you know, that's pretty straightforward and easy. But when you start talking about, well, you're managing for vehicles, but you're then you're also managing for um, the impact of the passengers in those vehicles on the resource, um, you've got to kind of marry the two together. Um, so, yeah, interesting. Um, comments there and um, certainly I would say that's probably one of our our challenges is addressing those those two act management actions in the different zones. Great thanks John. Uh, Darla I'm gonna um, ask you to respond uh, to the second part of this question. I can um, answer the first question that we have that really focus on resource concerns. Um, I've hiked trails with composting toilets. Uh, would that work in Rocky? And, you know, as we continue to look at our infrastructure matched with our level of visitation, and uh, we recently um, replaced vault to or toilet facilities, excuse me, not vault, but toilet facilities in the Longs Peak area, composting toilets do not work well in Rocky Mountain National Park because of our climate and our elevation and our soils. So that, that um, technology works really well in other areas, but unfortunately it is a challenge in Rocky. Um, another resource question, Darla, is will the park consider carrying capacity as a long-term management strategy? It seems like with the amount of visitors that the park receives, they are threatening some of the great resources that Rocky is trying to protect. Yeah, exactly. I think um, the visitor use management um, planning framework that Rachel talked about definitely addresses carrying capacity. You know, as we look at what are our desired conditions and then what are the indicators and standards when we know that we've reached those, I think you know, those are the kinds of um, data and analysis that we need to do to kind of have a good idea of what our carrying capacity is. You know, in, in many cases, it's it's limited by infrastructure, um, by acknowledging, documenting research on the impacts that it has, as John talked about, on wildlife, and then the, um, the encounter rates that visitors have with each other. So there's a lot of different factors that go into carrying capacity, but that is um, addressed through the visitor use management. 
planning framework. Thank you. So Darla, um, here's some other questions too that are really kind of addressing some of the staffing questions or staffing challenges. So um, let, me, let me take a couple of these um, and see if they all kind of fall together. Um, where does rule enforcement fit into the strategies? So that, that's something that, that I, I can address as well. So, you know, as we've continued to see with this level of visitation um, behavior issues as well, and again, we're not the only ones that are dealing with this, uh, Forest Service is, is um, dealing with this as well, some of the things that John mentioned, the legal campfires, um, you know, dogs on trails, uh, the, the approaching wildlife. So there's a number of our visitors that, um, most of our visitors act wonderfully. Um, some don't know and some don't care. So the ones that we really try to educate and connect with are those that don't know um, why their behavior matters when they're in a national park. And those are the ones we are certainly trying to connect with. We have a Rocky Pledge, again, really trying to connect with visitors on taking care of their national park. And so just the bigger picture, Darla, it sounds like there may be a shortfall in law enforcement staffing. Is this correct? and have rate increases to allow for more staff being um, considered. So maybe talk a little bit about that. Sure. Yeah, so Rocky's base budget, the, the annual budget that we get from Congress has remained relatively flat over the last, say, 10 years. Um, and, you know, that presents its challenges in terms of allocating the funding that we do get. I would say that you know we've got a fairly good law enforcement um, staff this summer. Um, certainly, you know, just like all other parks and all other forests and public lands management, you know, we wish we had more, but there is a limited amount of funding to go around, and parks compete for that funding. And so, um, we are, you know, very fortunate to be the recipients of some new funding this year under the Great American Outdoors Act that is really focused on helping us take care of our deferred maintenance in the parks. And for example, at Rocky Mountain National Park, we've got about $104 million deferred maintenance backlog. So that's, John showed the picture of those restrooms and you know some of those facilities that were very worn. And so there is a big initiative right now in the Park Service to invest in that deferred maintenance and um, Rocky will likely be a recipient of some of that funding, um, for example, you know, to help repair campgrounds, utilities, infrastructure, and that sort of thing. So, um, you know, the rangers are just one part of the park, and they're a very important part of the park in terms of managing visitors. Um, but, you know, we've got, we've got a lot of uh, facility management operations. We've got uh, other issues or other staffing with interpretive and education rangers who are also very um, instrumental in helping to educate visitors about how to behave in the park. So it's kind of a team effort really in um, getting that message across and helping, helping our visitors to um, behave well and to know the rules and how to, how to uh, utilize the park. What was the second part of that question, Kyle? I missed it, I think. I, I think just, you know, continuing to to address our staffing challenges when it comes to having a presence to educate and inform and, and in some cases enforce. Yes, so it's a continual challenge and, and uh, you know, we're constantly juggling our resources to, to find that right balance. And then the, the additional challenge the last two years with um, uh, affordable housing for some of our seasonal staff and shared housing. Um, with the guidance of COVID has also impacted us the last two years as, as well. Yeah, and, and actually the housing is, is not just a COVID situation, but, um, you know, for our, our lower graded employees that live in the park and pay rent, we've got limited um, park housing for those employees. And so obviously the resort communities of Estes Park and Grand Lake are quite expensive and, you know, it's tough to get um, seasonal rangers here or lower graded rangers who can afford to live here. And so that has definitely been an issue as we've been trying to hire, you know, 
people are very interested until they find out the cost of housing. Um, and then we get a lot of rejection notices. So housing is a um, significant issue, not just at Rocky, but in, in a lot of the parks and especially those that are near resort areas. Great, thank you, Darla. We've had a couple of questions on just general National Park Service um, sites as a whole. Are, are other parks doing this? Are there examples from other national parks which have completed this process? Um, or is there a finished product we can reference to see what this will ultimately look like? Um, each park is very, very unique. So one size does not fit all. And um, so I'd like to ask Rachel to briefly uh, talk about that. Yeah, sure. The um, framework work that we're talking about from the council was finished in 2016. And since that guidance was finalized and published, there have been around 15 plans in the Park Service that have fully integrated that guidance into completed plans. Um, those are actually publicly available. They're listed on that park planning site. So if you go on there um, and search for visitor use management plans, you can find them. And then there's some others that have different titles. So an example of that is the Acadia Transportation Plan fully integrates uh, the principles from the visitor use management framework into the planning process, even though it's under a different title. Um, in addition to those 15-ish, um, plans that are completely finished that fully integrate the framework. Many plans before that have integrated all the same principles of that, and you can see evidence of those when you um, go back and look at those plans. And last I counted, there's another 30 or 40 underway service-wide that are using that framework as scaffolding and guidance to develop their um, next steps for what are we managing for, how will we know, and what strategies will help us get there when it comes to visitor use management. Um, a number of those are in active planning processes that have had previous completed um, civic engagement efforts or have civic engagement underway. Again, you can go on to Pepsi, look for visitor use management plans um, to see examples of those. Um, and yeah, I think that we can follow up with more information if that's helpful, but you can also jump on the council's website to, to see that framework and that guidance or uh, park planning get in for example great thanks rachel and and i know guys we're reaching the seven little after 7 30 but i'm gonna wrap up a couple more uh, questions here um along those same lines rachel uh, a question i think you could piggyback on just really quickly again is you know we're non rmp areas surveyed to see worst case scenarios on on what rocky could become strategies employed in other areas if so where you know national parks only state parks only so I think maybe you could address how that interagency visitor use management council looks at uh, other uh, other public lands as well. Yeah, so that interagency guidance uh, is used by all six federal land management and water management agencies. And so it's the same framework that's used on um, places like the Maroon Bells plan, um, fully used the framework. Um, Hanging Lake also used the framework in their decision-making processes, so it's definitely not um, just a park service tool that we're using, but a lot of different folks are using that. Um, and also we can benefit from those lessons learned through those interagency collaborations. Um, when it comes to starting to think about worst case scenarios, I think one of the real benefits um, of the framework is the entire philosophy of it is built on being proactive. And that's really a response um, partially to our mission as an agency to be proactive managers of these places and to, as Sally Joel used to say, in the forever business for the protection of these things. Um, and so that's really the goal behind all the steps in this framework and the scaffolding that we use to build these plans on is starting to think about what are some of the proactive steps that we can be taking um, to be protecting those resources and again, would um, encourage folks, uh, if you really want to dig into the theory on that, to check out the guidance on the website. But one of those pieces of that is using those indicators and thresholds as tools to help us really understand how will we know when we're starting to depart from our desired conditions and what are the potential future actions we might take to help correct that condition to make sure that we're staying in a proactive management stance and not reacting to a condition that is um, moving away from our mission or potentially putting resources in a degraded condition. 
Thanks, Rachel. And, and again, I think this would just be helpful for folks because we've had a couple of questions on, you know, capacity. How do you determine capacity? Um, is it is it a visitor cap? So, you know, what is your desired visitation capacity? Could we just go back to 3 million visitors per year and cap it permanently? So, Rachel, maybe just talk a little bit about, um, you know, what, what we do first. We ID the conditions of the area and then if you could, you know, just share that. Yeah, you bet. So, there is a process for the capacity analysis and also for how we make capacity decisions in our agency. Um, and so your, Kyle started into it for me, really helpful is first we go and look at an area to start looking at what are the conditions that are currently on there and start looking at what are the potential resources and experiences that are directly connected to visitor use? Where are those relationships the strongest and where, um, how do we understand the relationship between those two things? The next step in that is really starting to have a better understanding of how my increases, decreases, or any changes in kinds or amounts of use um, impact those resources. What's the relationship between those activities as well as use levels and the desired conditions? And then we use that to inform a decision-making process about what is the maximum, um, both type and amount of use that an area can accommodate uh, while meeting and achieving its desired conditions. Uh, and so that's where we kind of look at all of those pieces together to help come up with that decision, again, from that proactive management stance. I think when it comes to understanding some of the relationship between a capacity and a visitation number, is that capacity is really connected to that resource or experiential condition and so oftentimes it's defined at a smaller unit of analysis than visitation because whether all of those people come one day or they come spread out throughout the year would have a different impact on the resource or experience that we're evaluating. And so understanding the time scale um, of that, whether that level of use has a bigger impact if it's sustained all the time or just at once is a meaningful part of that analysis. So we try to really hone in on what's the meaningful unit and time scale for that as well. So a lot of capacities are usually defined at smaller time scales than a full annual year. Um, and we're really managing again to that condition as opposed to the summation of that use over time. Great, thanks, Rachel. And again, the 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 link that's been put in the chat um, that if people you know have the interest to dive in and look at um, some of that, it, it uh, that that is available as well. Yeah, there's a whole guidebook on that website about how we do visitor capacity in the analysis process. It's a fascinating. Review. Very good. A uh, couple of other uh, things, and, and again, then we will um, wrap up. Um, we talk a little bit about, um, you know, do we have data regarding the average amount of time cars are parked at various lots, um, Bear Lake Park and Ride and Long's Peak area? Maybe consider limiting the parking time, provide shuttle service to hikers that would otherwise require all day parking at these lots. And so, you know, one of the challenges at Long's Peak is just the time that people go there is oftentimes two o'clock in the morning. So, you know, thinking through what a shuttle system would look like there. And again, the current parking lot is the capacity for Long's Peak now and the additional parking along the road. Um, so when you add shuttles in, then you add more people into those areas as well. John, could you talk a little bit um, briefly about some of our data on uh, parking lot turnover rates? Yeah, I can. Um, so uh, we have parking lot turnover rate data from 2008 and then again in 2013. And then we have some additional data um, that was from 2018 and that was gathered through um, the kind of a big data means that was um, from cell phone data uh, that was tracked and that uh, um, got dwell times for people at specific points in the park, not only parking lots, but also um, like out there approaching the entrance stations and things like that. And then also um, this summer, we are doing another parking lot turnover rate study. Um, and this will be taking place again at all the key lots. Um, these are you know, Bear Lake parking lot. Um, it's most of the lots this we're going to do this year. We're going to do most of the lots in the Bear Lake Road corridor. Um, but then we're also going to do the Alpine Visitor Center parking lot as well. 
Um, so yeah, we have some pretty good data. It's getting a little older now. That's why we're doing another one this summer moving forward. Um, but yeah, we have some um, some fairly decent information on length of stay. Um, again, I mentioned that 2017 um, visitor study. Uh, there was some GPS units handed out to visitors. So we have some uh, length of stay data from that as well. Great, thank you, John. Um, we have had a couple of questions of how do, how do you even determine what your visitor statistics are? And so just again, real, real quickly and briefly, there are um, certain uh, statistical calculations for different areas um, depending on the time of year. So just in a very high level, um, we have counters at all of our major entrance stations, as well as the Wild Basin area, Lily Lake, Lumpy Ridge, um, as well as locations on the west side that are uh, loop counters. Um, and then there's statistical formulas that calculate, again, you know, if people are going in and out, uh, doesn't count them twice. Um, and then different, um, basically, uh, multipliers, depending on the time of year. So 2.7 uh, is the multiplier for visitors September through May, and then three is the multiplier for June through August. And we calculate those statistics each month and that's consistent across the National Park Service as well. Uh, that's an important point to make so that we're all counting you know, similarly uh, with, our, uh, uh, with our connector loops as well as our um, multipliers. So just wanted to, to share that um, information as well as how we calculate that information. So I'm gonna jump back over and just wrap up a couple of um, additional questions. Bear with me here as I page down here. This question is a little bit tied to um, the, the National Environmental Policy Act as far as just understanding um, uh, that process. And again, I'm sorry, I'm trying to find uh, that question. I'm gonna have to probably come back to that, bear with me. I think along this, as I found another question here, the consideration for implementing ITS is also an innovative approach. Does the park currently have a way to monitor the number of cars in the park in real time? John, maybe you could uh, answer that, kind of piggyback your last response while I find the question on the National Environmental Policy Act. Yeah, currently we don't have a way to calculate the number of cars real time in the park. Um, as you saw in uh, the um, management strategies, um, technology like that would be uh, something we're looking at in the future. Uh, we do have data that we collected in 2013, in 17, and then last year, and planning on this year where we have um, hourly counts in specific areas of the park. Um, one of the things that we're looking at uh, you know, Kyle mentioned how we typically get statistics. We're looking at um, making some investment in that. And so we get hourly counts of vehicles uh, that would provide closer to real time data. Um, you know, there's a lot of technology out there um, that you see, you know, CDOT uses quite a bit of this where they um, read the MAC address on your phone or the toll tag and they, do that several times along the interstate and get you those times of like, oh, it's 15 minutes to, you know, I-70 from where you're at or, or whatever. That's how those are calculated. Um, we could move towards um, implementing some of those um, in some areas to calculate wait times and provide more real-time data. Um, something we're working at and looking at, um, but not, you know, currently we don't have the infrastructure for that. Great, thank you, John. And another question, just I think we can address really quickly. Um, the Wild Basin area hasn't been discussed much tonight. Why not do a shuttle system there if that hasn't been done yet? Um, it's a very primitive site and primitive, uh, you know, road. Um, and in that experience, we've heard from park visitors over the year they would like for it to continue to be that way. Um, and so having a shuttle system with that road would be very different. So John, you wanna just mention that? 
Yeah, I mean, and this kind of applies. I mean, this answer is going to kind of apply to other areas of the park. I mean, we we often hear about why don't you add a shuttle to Trail Ridge Road? Um, a couple of things about shuttles. Um, there seems to be this magic time of 20 minutes. It's the ride or the wait for the shuttle is longer than 20 minutes. Uh, there's significant drop off of the amount of people that want to take it. Um, the other thing about that for shuttle systems to work, uh, and then that ties in with that 20 minute thing, is you have to supply a pretty good amount of frequency. And that, um, you know, frequency translates into shuttles, which translates into dollars. And so we have to be strategic where we spend the money on shuttles to get the most um, out of them. You know, the Bear Lake corridor works so well because we can move a pretty good volume of people through that corridor in a timely fashion. Um, you know, we ran the hiker shuttle um, starting in 2006. And only when we started to do Bear Lake road restrictions did the use of that um, increase. And that's just because that was the only way to access, um, you know, during the restriction time. So there's a lot to go in. There's a lot that goes into adding shuttles, you know, and that's just on the operational side. Kyle mentioned it earlier in one of the responses. There's also, you know, you, you take the artificial cap of the parking availability off. And you can, you know, if you're not strategic with the scheduling of the shuttles, uh, you can you can put a lot of people into the resource that might not be able to handle it. You know, in a place like Wild Basin, um, you know, there's some good trails down there, but you know, are they ready to handle you know busloads of people coming in every 20 minutes? You know, perhaps not. Um, so there's a lot that goes to it. You know, not only adding shuttles, adding restrooms. Um, so there's a lot to consider. Great, thank you, John. Um, Darla, I'm going to ask for your um, response on this question. You know, we know that the east side of the park has about 85% of our visitors come in through the east side. Many of them will travel over to the west side. We have about 15% that come in from the west side. So the, the question is, um, why is there timed entry on the west side if the volume is so much lower? And you know, just the, the overall having again to manage this as an overall system. Right, and so we've talked a lot about that and whether there should be a different um, approach, but essentially, um, you know, we, we need to manage the park as, as one kind of system. And so, um, you know, no matter if you're sitting in Denver and you're getting a, a permit on recreation.gov, it could be a lot easier to come through the west side. So we don't, you know, we don't expect that people will necessarily continue to use the east side as much as they have. That could be the case, but we can't just automatically assume that. But we're looking at the overall um, park-wide issue and the parking on the west side of the park is much, much less um, than the east side. I think, you know, the, again, the bulk of the visitation here on the east side and the bulk of the trails and the bulk of the roads and the bulk of the, the parking. And so, um, you know, people coming in from the west side, there are certainly a lot of them that do go up to Alpine Visitor Center, just like the east side. So, you know, the, the intent right now with managing the system is as one part is just to, um, you know, try to have that more holistic approach. Um, but we're, you know, just like all of the other really good ideas y'all have come up with tonight, you know, we're certainly open to looking at different ways to do that as it, you know, as it warrants, um, because we certainly recognize that there's an opportunity for more visitors to, to go into the west side. Are you there, Kyle? <laughs> My apologies. Mute. I was muted. My apologies. Um, Darla, I'm going to um, ask uh, for you to explain this um, as well. And then again, just honoring people's times, we'll wrap up with uh, one more question after this one. Um, the question is, if we're collecting $25 at our entrance station, 
Um, and I do want to um, mention the $2 fee for reservations goes to recreation.gov for managing that system. The park does not keep the $2. So if we're getting $25 a day uh, for a vehicle pass and Rocky gets 80% of that money, um, where does that money go? So if maybe you could describe how we keep 80%, but how much goes to the shuttle system, how much goes to deferred maintenance um, might, might help. Right, so yeah, we, um, you know, we do collect a fair amount coming through the entrance and that is called our um, recreation fees. And so that's the money that pays also for our campgrounds, it pays for our um, fee staff, and it also, um, we get about 80% of that, as Kyle said. And then the rest, um, it goes through a couple of different uh, filters and we end up with really about $2 million um, to take care of, of projects in the park. And so um, the, the, the budget really is <laughs> consumed by a lot of the um, ongoing operations we have. I forgot to mention shuttle buses, that's in there too. So that recreation fee that's collected pays for all of those things. And at the end of the day, there's not much left in there. Okay, thank you, Dar. Jumping back again to my mute button. Um, you know, a couple of other things that um, people have asked about, has there been any consideration of use, utilizing a road lottery for popular areas like Denali National Park does? And you know, certainly lotteries are, are one of the tools that can be um, considered. We basically did a, a drawing for our wilderness camping permits this year because we had such a high demand for those. And, and you know, again, there's um, pros and cons to a lottery system as well. They oftentimes can work really well for a high demand um, and low supply scenarios. So, you know, again, if this is something that you would like to you know, uh, provide more information on or your thoughts on that through through the Pepsi site. That would be um, that would be great as well. Looking at the pros and cons of that uh, system. Another question was, you know, should we limit uh, CUAs? Are we considering that as part of this process? Um, we uh, our concession and CUAs make up about three to five percent of our visitors. John, you want to reference that? Yeah, um, certainly they'll, you know, moving forward in the long range plan, they're going to be considered of, of where they fit in and, and how they, you know, can help the uh, address some of the operational and, and the needs for the park as well. Um, you know, like Kyle mentioned, it's about three to 5% of our visitors experience the park through a commercial uh, entity. Um, you know, when you put that in perspective with other national parks, that's pretty low, um, but that doesn't mean that it's going to stay that way. Um, so they're going to be incorporated into this long range plan of, of how, um, you know, what their role is, how they'll fit in with this. Um, you know, it's, it is a, a good way for, for many people, a good option for many people to experience the park um, because they can get some good information and they can, um, you know, don't have to worry about driving or, or whatever the activity they, they want to do. So yeah, we're, we're going to be rolling them into the long range plan and, and where they fit into the whole um, visitor use picture. Great, just a couple more. Thanks for hanging in there, everybody. Um, other than the time entry pilot system, are there other specific programs you're piloting this summer? that you are considering for the long range planning effort. And so I can certainly share that one of the things we were thinking about when we were looking again at this increased uh, visitation that we were seeing in the park and the trends that Darla was mentioning as far as the COVID crush, we talked about the concept of metering at our entrance stations and um, you know, basically just stopping at a certain time when the parking lots were full. And we know that there's challenges with that. Um, we continue to watch the challenges that our colleagues at Arches National Park are having. Um, you know, for instance, on Monday, because of the level of uh, visitation there, they had to basically close the park at 8.30 in the morning. 
um, and uh, were not able to really provide to visitors when they could come back at the end of the day. So Darla or John, do you want to mention anything else about some of the other, you know, pilots and, and either the challenges or the timing of those? Yeah, I can't really think of anything right off the top of my head um, other than this. I mean, this is a significant um, initiative. And as we mentioned, it's, it's a few year project proposal. And so um, we'll probably continue to, um, you know, again, collect lessons learned from what we've done here um, the past couple of years and this year and continue to refine um, what we're doing with visitor use. But I'm not thinking of anything else that just comes to mind. Um, this is our primary um, interest and focus is, is certainly ensuring that we're um, protecting the resources and dealing with the visitor management. But John, is there anything that we're missing? Uh, no, not really. I mean, other, you know, some of the minor, more minor things we're still going to be doing, use of variable message signs, uh, you know, information kind of things. But one of the, I mean, what I will mention is one of the things that the pilot of the timed entry does is it does get us out of, you know, hopefully, you know, managing the Alpine Visitor Center, um, doing restrictions in Wild Basin, um, you know, certainly doing restrictions, um, you know, impromptu in, in the Bear Lake Road corridor. So it does kind of replace some of the pilots that we previously have done um, as a kind of a more encompassing solution. Great, thank you. And a couple of wrap up questions. People ask if there's promotional efforts to um, promote those lesser visited national parks. And, and yes, there are. There's some active campaigns to encourage people to go elsewhere. Um, we do know that just regionally, we're, we work really closely with our, um, with our partners and in, in the Forest Service and in county uh, open space areas and state parks. And we know that there's a, you know, a, a challenge as to where to encourage people to go because everybody um, is dealing with really high uh, visitation in this area. So we don't have places locally necessarily to send people to, to other public lands because they're experiencing the same crowding. So that becomes you know, a challenge just regionally uh, and statewide. And so just acknowledging that upfront is gonna be really important as well. And we have been doing that for years. Um, you know, the question is to uh, the, the attendees and the, these um, seminars, we have our next one scheduled. We have uh, promoted it through news releases um, and in our robust social media area. And so we'll continue to encourage people to join us on the May 27th. What's so great about virtual meetings is these recordings uh, of the meetings will be posted and people have 60 days. So if they weren't able to join one of these seminars, they still will be able to get involved, which is, which is uh, wonderful. We also, um, people ask, do we use volunteers to help spread the word? And Rocky Mountain National Park has one of the largest volunteer programs in the National Park Service system. They serve an extremely valuable role in helping us uh, educate visitors and connect with visitors. So um, it's a system that we have in place and we rely heavily on those volunteers. So just for those that were asking the question about, you know, could we use volunteers? to help, we, we do share that as well. And are always, always eager to hear people's uh, suggestions. Um, please go into Pepsi and help us uh, with ideas on how we can continue to spread the word about how to, how to behave. Some people suggested a quiz that you have to pass before you come into the park. Um, so uh, with that, um, I will pass it back to Darla. And thank you again so much for your time and your questions. Realizing that many people had some specific questions and we put in the chat where you can find information on the time entry and or send an email after you've looked at the frequently asked question. If we still haven't answered your question, please send it to Romo underscore information at nps.gov and we'll get back with you. Darla, back to you. Okay, great. Thanks so much, Kyle. Um, thanks you all for hanging in there. Um, let's see, looks like 69 people um, are still online. So just a quick close out, um, really appreciate y'all being here and taking this really valuable time out of, out of your evening tonight to be with us. 
And please know that your input is, is very valuable and important to us. Y'all have submitted some really great questions tonight and some, some good ideas, uh, other management strategies as well. So we appreciate that. Um, and just know that you know this first civic engagement meeting is really the kickoff to this long-term plan. Um, visitor use management in a park such as Rocky that is so popular is obviously a really complex issue and there's no easy answers. I think you know one of the things perhaps that we all can agree on is that Rocky Mountain National Park is really an amazing gem for Colorado, for the United States, and really it's an international destination as well. So um, we just are needing to ensure that we are in fact managing the park and ensuring that our park resources are here and protected for future generations and that your kids and your kids' kids still have the opportunity to visit this park and have that, those great experiences with resources intact. So um, please get onto the Pepsi website, let us know again, you know, what you most value about the park, what your thoughts are about this webinar, um, and if you have any other suggestions or ideas or the ones you've presented tonight that you would like to be recorded officially, um, please put those on there. Um, as mentioned earlier, stay tuned. There will be a report um, that will be consolidated and generated that we'll share with you all. Um, I think the timeline is this fall. So with that, thanks for hanging in there in an extra 30 minutes, and we will conclude this meeting. So thanks, everyone, and have a great evening. Bye-bye.